Welcome back. Our next presentation is on detecting the online sale of aquatic invasive species with Gladiator. Erica Jensen serves as executive director of the Great Lakes Commission. Erica directs operations, manages relations with the commission's board of directors and commissioners, oversees policy and advocacy efforts, and collaborates with the agency's numerous partners to advance strategic regional priorities, among other duties. Prior to her appointment, Erica directed the Commission's Aquatic Invasive Species Program. In that role, she served as coordinator for the Great Lakes Panel on Aquatic Nuisance Species and Invasive Mussel Collaborative, and was the Commission's designee to the U.S. Federal Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force. Erica has been a member of the Commission's staff in various roles since 2006. Erica has a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University and a master's degree in environmental management from Duke University. Joining Erica is Patrick Caniff. Patrick joined the Great Lakes Commission in 2019 and works as a program specialist for the Commission's Invasive Species Program area. Patrick currently supports ongoing efforts advancing the progress of regional priorities for the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative, Invasive Mussel Collaborative, Blue Accounting Aquatic Invasive Species Issue, and the Great Lakes Detector of Invasive Aquatics in Trade. Previously, Patrick has contributed to NOAA GLANSIS, which is the Great Lakes Aquatic non-indigenous species information system to compile and evaluate species risk assessments and the Great Lakes Panel on Aquatic Nuisance Species. Patrick holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science from Loyola University Chicago and a master's degree in conservation ecology and environmental informatics from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Erica and Patrick. Hi, this is Erica. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm going to start with an apology this morning. I had uh, dental work this morning, so if I'm not coming through clearly, uh, let me know and I will hand off to Patrick uh, and he can step in for me. So this whole side of my face is a little bit numb still. <laughs> All right. Uh, but thanks for inviting us uh, today to talk about our uh, project looking at the internet sale of aquatic invasive species. Uh, this is an effort the commission has been involved in for um, a number of years. Our first uh, effort started in about 2013. So we've been working on this for a while. I'm just getting my screens arranged here. Hopefully you can see that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Great. So um, today I'll give a little bit of a, a history of our project um, since we've been working on this, like I said, since 2013, uh, and then uh, let you know where we're at today and give you a, a bit of a preview on uh, what our next steps are. Um, so as I mentioned, um, We've been working on this project for a number of years. We began the effort in 2012, excuse me, uh, with a four-year funded project through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Uh, and at that time, um, the commission had been working with our aquatic invasive species partners, uh, looking at the trade and live organisms pathway for invasive species introduction and spread. And through that work, our partners identified uh, the availability of species for sale over the internet as a, an important issue that we thought was contributing to the pathway, uh, but not a lot of information was available on the pathway and sort of what was going on, what was available over the internet, um, how you know, pervasive was the pathway and the availability of species we were concerned about on the internet. So um, we developed a project um, that would use um, what's called web crawling or web scraping software <coughs> to um, automate the process of searching the web for uh, invasive species that we were concerned about. So as opposed to somebody just you know, uh, doing a Google search on their own, 
Uh, this would actually be an automated software tool uh, that would make it a much more uh, efficient and faster process to uh, collect information on what species uh, are available on the internet. So we would develop that software, uh, demonstrate it as a tool, and then actually use it to collect information about what was being sold and provide that to our partners and managers uh, to then take action on as appropriate, be it outreach uh, to sellers, um, or in some cases where species are illegal, the potential for um, legal action or enforcement action also exists. So we uh, successfully completed that project, developed um, what we affectionately call the gladiator system, uh, which as was said, is the Great Lakes Detector of Invasive Aquatics in Trade. So we developed that system along with a online dashboard where folks could log in and see uh, the results that this web crawling system was returning. Because we were successful in that effort, um, we applied for a second grant from the US EPA Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to uh, continue this work. So to update uh, and improve the system, we identified some opportunities to improve the software that we developed, um, establish a more formal advisory committee that could engage with us on this effort, uh, provide input on the update, and also help us with the management activities. So what do we do with this information once we have it? Uh, and then continuing to provide results from this web crawling tool to, to our managers and others that could take action on it. So those are sort of the two phases of our work. Um, we're currently wrapping up this phase two um, and uh, working on the final report for that, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. So uh, just briefly on how Gladiator functions, um, the system, um, does a search uh, of the internet in the same way that you might do it. Uh, it just is an, a more automated search. And it collects a list of websites. And then it actually looks at those websites and uh, inspects them for specific search terms that we provide to the software system. And if those terms are found, then it does um, some additional analysis to determine uh, if this page is one that we are concerned about and one that we wanted to identify with Gladiator. So the search terms the system is looking for when it inspects the page are actually the species names that we give it. So we predetermined a list of invasive species that were of concern to the Great Lakes region that we wanted to find out if they were being sold on the internet or not. So those are the search terms the system is looking for. And then this sort of decision about whether it is a page we're concerned about um, is a classifier piece of this that looks at whether um, and attempts to determine whether the page is an actual page that's selling the species or whether it's more just a informational fact sheet, you know, here's some information about that species. So the system uh, attempts to make that differentiation as well. Um, the species names that we give it, we termed our species watch list. Uh, we used a number of sources to compile that watch list. Uh, in our first go, we ended up with about 166 species that we were interested in determining whether they were uh, available on the internet or not. So during that phase one, um, our key outcomes were we developed that web crawling system that I just described. We deployed the Gladiator system and we identified over 200 different websites and sellers that were uh, marketing species that we were concerned about. And of those over 200 uh, unique sellers, we identified 58 of the species we were looking for. And several of those species are on a list that our governors and premiers in the Great Lakes region determined are least wanted and committed to as states and provinces regulating those species. Uh, so they're already on the list of, of regulated species. We also saw a number of highly invasive plants that are concerned in the Great Lakes region, but also in other areas of the country. And uh, invasive aquatic plants that we are in fact spending 
uh, millions of dollars in some cases to control on an annual basis. So things like uh, water soldier, hydrilla, Brazilian elodea, parrot feather, and other uh, plants like that. We also um, spent some time looking at the data to figure out where some of these sellers were located. And we determined that um, over 60% of the uh, sellers that we identified were actually based in the US. So since we're searching the web, you know, we recognize that uh, and the opportunity exists for species to be sold from overseas and other parts of the world to the US. Um, but actually what we found was over 60% we identified through our system uh, were based in the US. So moving on from that, as I mentioned, we wanted to uh, do some additional work in a phase two to uh, enhance our Gladiator system. So that included adding some features that we did not have before. And then in order to actually um, try to uh, direct meaningful action to manage this pathway, our vision was to develop a list of uh, priority species that were for sale that we would target for outreach and action. So we would work with our partners to um, conduct outreach and other actions towards uh, sellers that were selling species on this priority list that we identified. And our objective was to see if we could make a measurable reduction in the availability of those species in the online marketplace. Uh, now here's where we ran into some trouble. So, um, when we developed our Gladiator system in 2012 to about 2014, which was when we first deployed it, um, this web crawling, web software technology, and those algorithms were a relatively new technology that was being used. Uh, but as you are probably familiar, technology evolves rapidly these days. And um, we found that uh, some of the um, components of the system that we developed were quickly falling out of date uh, and the technology was evolving faster than we could keep up with it. And so as a result, the, the unique system that we developed um, sort of became uh, cumbersome and unmanageable to keep up to date with all the, the advancements in this type of technology. So we had to do a bit of a pivot in, during our phase two um, and um, learning from the advancement of the technology, we recognize that there are a number of sort of off the shelf third party tools that could be applied at a low cost to, to do for us what Gladiator was doing, at least in some form. And so um, we wanted to um, look at some of these third party tools and determine you know, how well could they do what Gladiator did and what sort of the cost uh, and feasibility of using these um, third party services going forward, given that, um, you know, if you invest a small amount in working with these services, it's sort of on them to make sure that the technology work, works and is kept up to date uh, versus us at the commission, a very small agency that's highly dependent on uh, federal and state resources being able to keep up and maintain a, an advanced technology system. So we did a little bit of a shift there and we added and um, decided that we will look at these third party web crawling services to evaluate their, um, their use for our purposes. And then we would still use those services to conduct that uh, search for our priority list of species that we wanted to target for outreach and action. So the three um, services that we looked at as a potential um, replacement for Gladiator were um, Octoparse, Scrape Hero, and Marquee Data. So these are all companies and services that anyone can go out and pay to use their web crawling technology. Um, we very, very quickly determined that Octoparse was not going to be a good fit for us. Uh, so the, our work focuses um, on uh, using both Scrape Hero and Marquee to sort of give us two examples and two options uh, for web crawling services going forward. So once we went through that initial feasibility assessment and decided we were going to work with Scrape Hero Marquee data, 
we provided those two providers with our uh, target species list. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we started with a list of 166 species. We worked with our advisory committee to say, uh, to determine what are the, you know, a, a subset, a top list of priority species that you really want to target for reducing their availability in the online marketplace. So we established a couple of criteria to determine what those species would be. And so you see the list on, on the screen here, uh, and it includes um, fish, invertebrates, and aquatic plants. So we have a diversity of taxa represented here, uh, and some of the um, plants we found most frequently uh, the first time around, uh, like hydrilla, as I mentioned before, or water soldier. So we worked with Scrape Hero and Marquee Data to deploy their uh, web crawling system on this priority species list and provide the data to us to do some additional analysis and action on. So what I'm gonna go through next is uh, our sort of preliminary findings from that work. So um, this is not the final data. Um, we're still um, doing some final analysis and cleanup of this data, but our preliminary findings are, are what I'll share next. So in a search of those um, species, we found um, 385 sellers of these priority species that we identified. Uh, and um, the most frequently found uh, species among those sellers is water lettuce, uh, followed uh, shortly after by uh, Malaysian trumpet snail, uh, Brazilian water weed, uh, fish as known as the weather loach, and then some additional plants and crayfish from there. So um, when we did our search, we did target, we were able to work and target our searches to sort of limit our um, searches to, to US and Canadian sellers, uh, where we felt we had um, some jurisdiction to take action. Next, um, again, as I mentioned, number of sellers by species. So water lettuce and Malaysian trumpet snail which are the two most frequently found uh, species in the, um, and this is by sellers in the Great Lakes region. So when we filter out the all 385 sellers to just those who are located in our eight states and two provinces, um, this is the, the results that we get. So there are 94 sellers that we identified in our searches in the located in the Great Lakes region. Uh, and if we look at, if we break that down by jurisdiction across North America, you'll see that most of the sellers we identified are located in California and Florida. Um, I don't think that that is surprising. Um, and then um, there's a significant drop off from there. And then we see um, uh, some sellers in Ohio, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, sort of the next set of um, number of sellers, the most that we found. So that gives you kind of a breakdown by jurisdiction where we found um, these sellers to be located geographically. And if we look specifically at our Great Lakes region, um, you see Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania sort of coming in at the top there with the, the most number of sellers we identified of the, the species that we were concerned about. And then as I mentioned, our, our, one of our objectives for this was to then take those sellers, um, and in particular those in the Great Lakes region, and do some outreach to let them know that they were selling species that were of concern to our region that were potentially invasive and encourage them to take actions that could help reduce the risk that those species would be introduced into our region. Everything from not selling them at all to listing um, specific shipping restrictions where species are illegal so they can't ship to those states and providing uh, invasive species awareness information to their customers. So we gave them a number of things that, of actions that they could take uh, in response to our communication. 
So we reached out to uh, 126 of the sellers um, via a variety of mechanisms, uh, electronic message, uh, a contact form, and in some cases, uh, a couple of phone calls or a site visit. So we worked with our uh, advisory committee members on this outreach. So folks that are in these uh, state agencies who have uh, responsibility and jurisdiction for this issue. Uh, so in some cases, you know, a couple of those uh, folks went out and did site visits to the, the sellers in their jurisdiction. And then we uh, tracked what kind of response we received uh, from our outreach. So again, a lot of this was passive. We sent it an email um, or filled out a contact form. So we wanted to record, did the sellers respond to our outreach? Um, about a third did and about two thirds did not, which is a, a slightly higher percentage than um, our previous outreach that we had done under the phase one. And then we attempted to track, um, not only did they respond, but did they make any changes following our outreach? So. Um, of the, the sellers we were able to um, follow up with, um, eight of them um, were no longer selling the species after our outreach, uh, and 59 others um, had some other modified response. So uh, many of them were still selling the species, but some had added shipping restrictions to their page. Um, some were no longer selling the species of concern that we had originally identified, but then they were selling a different one that was on our list. Um, so still, you know, engaging with species that were of concern to us. So um, some progress there, um, and we'll, you know, continue to update this as we get more information back from our partners on the outreach that they did and any behavior change that they noticed. So in terms of our next steps, as I mentioned, we are um, doing the final analysis and summary of our data, which will go into a final report. That final report will also include sort of our assessment and recommendations regarding working with third-party services like Scrape Hero and Marquee. So for folks who are interested in doing their own searches on their own species lists, providing some information and recommendations about cost, effectiveness, uh, feasibility of working with these, these services in the future. Uh, and then um, having discussion with our advisory committee and our Great Lakes Aquatic Nuisance Species Panel about you know, where do we go with this pathway in the future? How do we wanna to continue to work on um, assessing and managing the availability of species in the online marketplace? So, uh, discussing with our partners sort of what our next steps and, and avenues for additional action are. So I'll stop there and just, you know, this slide acknowledges a number of folks, um, both on the commission staff side, our partners, as well as um, some contractors we worked with to develop the original Gladiator system. Uh, a lot of folks have been involved in this project over the years, uh, and we wouldn't have been able to do this work without them. So with that, I will stop and happy to answer any questions. Uh, Patrick has done a lot of the work working with Scrape Hero and Marquee and looking at the data and sort of evaluating what kinds of services um, could be a, an effective replacement for Gladiator. So uh, if you have more technical questions, I might defer to Patrick to answer some of those. Thank you, Erica. First question, was there any labeling or notification on the websites that these were non-native plants or they were invasive plants? Were the sellers being upfront about what they were selling? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, and that's sort of what I was, uh, was getting at. Um, one of the actions that we looked at is whether they noted shipping restrictions. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, there are sellers that will say, you know, this plant or animal is invasive in some location, you know, understand what your state and local laws are. And, you know, we are prohibited from shipping this species to X, Y, and Z state because of those reasons. So not consistent, but I think between the first phase of the project and, and this phase, 
we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, it's starting to become more common that that some sort of notice like that is is on there, but it's not universal. Would you Patrick, know I know you you did a lot of um, looking at these sites. Did you want to add anything to that? Oh, you're on mute. Still can't hear you. <laughs> It's Friday and technology has, has taken off early for the weekend. <laughs> well, while Patrick is connecting, is do you know of anything similar that's being done for a land a terrestrial invasive species? Or just um, is anything similar to this anywhere for any species, really, or any group of species? Yeah, um, I am aware that USDA has done some work in this area. So our original gladiator idea, um, there was a, a, a sort of pilot effort within USDA that had developed a similar system. Uh, but at the time, this was, you know, as I mentioned, much less common technology. And so they had worked with a sort of commercial company and it was uh, far too costly for them to continue. Um, but I think that, um, they are, you know, USDA is still actively tracking uh, from a plant perspective, be it aquatic or terrestrial, uh, the online marketplace and, and continuing to, to work in this area. I've seen um, a couple other one-off studies, um, but nothing else quite like what, what we've done. But certainly now that these um, third-party tools exist that anybody could use, um, it could be used for sort of anything you're, you're searching for on the web. We've, uh, it's come up in the past, you know, people have been interested in looking for on the opposite side, illegal trafficking of endangered species, uh, as opposed to, you know, potentially invasive. So there's a number of, you know, potential applications in the natural resource world for, for this kind of technology. All right. Do you think that water hyacinth is sold at about the same number of sellers as water lettuce some have seen water lettuce uh, let's see well yeah i don't know one of them has been sold at nurseries or both sold together at nurseries let's see but anything on yeah water lettuce versus the water hyacinth yeah and i think um, I would have to go back to our original project where we had both on the list. Um, I think on our current list, we just have water lettuce. We don't have water hyacinth. Mm. Uh, it didn't cut, quite make the cut for this. Um, but um, if Patrick wants to weigh in the other species, I might be able to pull up the data from our original project and let you know in 2014 sort of what the comparison was. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I can I, I can weigh in a little bit here. Um, as far as what I've seen as we were going through some of the results and kind of verifying some of these sale pages, um, I think it's it's not uncommon to see them both being sold by the same uh, seller, but there are definitely instances of um, one being sold over the other. It kind of also depends on what kind of seller is um, selling these species. Um, you have individual sellers selling on eBay or Amazon versus, um, and they might be selling only one um, species um, among a variety of products that might, you know, one species of living organism versus other products, uh, consumer products and, and the like, um, versus some of these sellers that are more specialized in aquarium species that we found through um, searches on Bing, or um, they might have uh, more associated um, species from this list than um, individual sellers on other sites as well. But we did we did see some connection between um, multiple species for sale among, especially among plant species. Okay. Yeah, and I was just looking at our data, and I actually don't see a lot on water hyacinth. It's mostly water lettuce, but. The other caveat to this is we didn't order any of the species. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're going by what they're advertising and relying on their sort of 
correct identification of what the species is. So we didn't validate any of this by, by ordering and seeing actually what we got based on what they were advertising. All right. All right. Well, people like your logo and your acronym. <laughs> And uh, that's it on the question. We're questions. fond of it and as now. well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the best acronym. I've said that before, but you definitely do. All right. Any, uh, that's it for the questions. Well, like I said, we're wrapping up our final report on this phase. So all this will be available along with our, our recommendations if anybody wants to attempt this in the future and you know, kind of what we learned from doing this. And you know, Patrick and I are happy to be a resource uh, going forward if, if folks want to dive into this any further. All right, wonderful. Any other questions, anyone out there? Put them in the chat. And I think that's, that's it then. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. And uh, good Thanks luck with us. all your endeavors. Nice research, someone said. And people are saying thank you. So th thank you very much and have a nice weekend. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, Happy the other holidays. thing I'll do real quick is yeah. the, the final report and what we found the first time around is available on our website. So I'll just throw the link in the chat if people want to see you know, the, okay. the results from our, our first phase of the project. Great. All right. All right. Well, thank you again thank for you. inviting us. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Any other business? And I think also we have a date for our next Lisma meeting, which is January 21st. So mark your calendars. You don't want to miss this. January 21st for our next partners meeting. Any Bill, other thoughts, comments, questions? Bill, this is Tom. I, um, so I've been a little distracted during the meeting because late in the day yesterday, we had a report of giant African land snail found in uh, New York, in a location in New York City. And uh, we were reacting to that and uh, trying to get confirmation. Um, well, turns out that the giant African land snail reported was a statue. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, at the Bronx Zoo, in one of the enclosures, <laughs> for one of the African animals, there is a small, um, well, not small, I mean, it's a giant African land snail, uh, but there's a life-size replica statue glued to, a, you know, cemented to a rock in one of the enclosures and somebody <laughs> saw it and reported it and uh you know it was a visitor from georgia and they reported it and it kind of sent us into a panic uh but um so if anyone hears about giant african land snails at the bronx zoo um, <laughs> it's true there is a statue of giant african land snail at the bronx zoo uh yeah. <laughs> so just i thought everyone would kind of find the humor in that and and you know that's the kind of thing that we deal with you know not often that it turns out to be a statue but, <laughs> but we get a report of something that we have to quickly track it down um but if anyone does hear any rumors of that it's it's true there is a statue so. and and polly said it was moving very slowly yes <laughs> they were they, 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 <laughs> actually the zoo it's been there since 1999 the zoo staff had actually <laughs> forgotten it was there and they were in just as much of a panic as we were until they got to the site and they looked at the rock and they're like, oh, it's the statue. Like they've seen it a thousand times. They just really haven't thought about it. But um, that's about as, as, as easy of a spot as a invasive species <laughs> report as we've ever dealt with. Um, that's so pretty funny. Found the humor in that, but um, it was a little scary this morning. So I've been yeah. back and forth with lots of text messages, lots of phone calls while I've been on this meeting. And uh, it, I'm glad it resolved itself. And I could share the funny uh, little story at the end here. So, yeah, sorry. Steve Young mentioned in the chat exactly what I was thinking. Make sure it doesn't have spotted lanternfly egg cases on it because it could. All right, thanks, Tom. 
Yeah. Uh, Jane, we did, we did ask about the land-based invasive species being sold online. And uh, I don't know what the full answer was, but it, it, this, this technology could be used for anything. It could be used for land-based or it could be used for endangered species. I don't think we ever came up with a specific project that's using it for land-based invasive species. But uh, Erica addressed that. Nothing specific as far as I, as far as I know. Anything else? There's a link there. Oh, <laughs> there's a link to the, there's an article already. That's hysterical. If, uh, if no one has anything else to add, we can adjourn. Everyone have a nice weekend and have a happy Thanksgiving and ho happy holidays. Happy New Year. All of it. We'll see you after the new year. Thank you, Bill. You too. Thanks. Bye, everybody.